The following program is a special presentation of Pioneer Public Television. Meet the Candidates is brought to you by Pioneer Public Television. The next hour is intended to encourage debate and educate you, the voter, about the candidates running for office. The end result is for voters to be able to make an informed decision on election day. Participate in the process by sending in your questions. Next up are the candidates for House District 12A. Jay McNamer from Elbow Lake, Scott Dutcher from Brandon, and Dave Holman from Morris. Welcome to Pioneer Public Television's Meet the Candidates. I'm the moderator of tonight's program, Amy Dahl Wallers. I look forward to hearing from you tonight. This is the opportunity for the viewers to get to know their local candidates running for state office. Tonight, we are going to listen to the candidates who are running for the House 12A seat. We will be starting the program tonight with opening statements, then moving on to the questions, and of course, wrapping up with closing statements. Tonight we have three candidates running for the position of seat, uh, House Seat 12A. We'll be looking at a map of that district in just a moment, but first let's meet those candidates. The first candidate is from Elbow Lake and is running as the DFL candidate, Jay McNamer. Jay, welcome. Thank you. Next we have a candidate from Morris running as the Independence Party, and this is Dave Holman. Welcome, Dave. Well, thank you. And finally we have a candidate from Brandon who is the Republican candidate, Scott Dutcher. Welcome, Scott. We are going to take a look at the map now of the House District 12A. I want to make sure that you really take a good look at that, at that map because the district has changed, and you want to make sure you know that you're voting in the right area. So let's just take a minute to take a look at that map. House District 12A includes all of Big Stone, Traverse, Grant, Stevens, and Wilkin counties plus the western half of Douglas and Pope counties. The district includes the cities of Ortonville, Morris, Wheaton, Elbow Lake, Breckenridge, Starbuck, and Evansville, to name a few. If this is your district, please call in with your questions this evening of your local candidates. We will be starting with a three-minute opening remark for each candidate. After the opening remarks, we'll take a short break while we take your calls so that you can ask your questions. Jay McNamer won the toss to, open the, uh, to give his first opening remarks. So, Jay, if you would please like to give your opening remarks. Well, thanks for inviting me here tonight. I am Jay McNamer, a retired volunteer fireman, a retired teacher, an active EMT for Prairie Ridge Hospital, and currently the mayor of Elbow Lake. My wife of 44 years and I have lived in western Minnesota all our lives. We lived in Elbow Lake for 41 years, where we both taught school and raised two daughters. Our daughters attended West Central Area School and graduated from Minnesota Universities. I'm running for the House of Representatives because I'm the mayor of Elbow Lake. During the first three years of my term as mayor, we were unallotted local government aid. This made it difficult to balance the budget, but we used prudent spending and bid out our health insurance to save money. With the help of my council and city staff, we were able to reduce our levy 4% over the length of my term as mayor. However, right now, we are at the point where any further reductions of local government aid could mean a loss of services, an increase in property taxes, or both. 18 months ago, I was asked by Mayor R.T. Ryback of Minneapolis to join him in a news conference in Alexandria with other local mayors. Mayor Ryback was trying to prevent his city from losing local government aid. However, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Duluth did lose local government aid. At the end of the news conference, Mayor Ryback stated, we will lose our local government aid this year. You could lose yours in 2013. If our city loses LGA, which is 40 percent of our budget, we could lose our police force, our library, and half of our city staff. 
We are no different than other cities in West Central Minnesota, such as Breckenridge, Morris, Ortonville, Starbuck, Graceville, and on and on and on. I can't let this happen. It would drastically change our rural communities and the lifestyle that I have lived with all my life and love. The second reason I'm running for the House is that we passed, like many other districts, a referendum a year ago to keep our school from deficit spending. This means we voluntarily raised our property taxes to support our school, and our property taxes are high. But it wasn't good enough. Our school had to borrow $1 million to make it through the year because of late state aid. The million dollars did not come free. The interest paid on the million dollars could have been used for books, curriculum, teachers' aids. There are only two states in the nation that allow the budget to be balanced on the backs of schools, Minnesota and California. We need to change this. So California is the only state to allow this to occur. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Next, Scott Dutcher will give his opening remarks. Scott? Thank you. My name's Scott Dutcher, and I'm running for the Minnesota legislature for one reason. I want to get our economy back on the right track. Out here in western Minnesota, getting our economy back on the right track really means focusing on supporting our small businesses, our Main Street Minnesota businesses. There's a lot of things that we can do to do that, but we need to understand that those small businesses are the engine of our economic job creation and our economic growth going forward. To support these businesses, I want to reduce commercial property taxes for Main Street, Minnesota, to help out our, our small businesses, make sure that business owners have a few extra dollars in their pocket. I want to create jobs incentive programs so that our small businesses, when they're ready to expand and grow and hire more, that they do it right here in western Minnesota, that they don't go to Fargo or Sioux Falls or down to the Twin Cities. You know, getting the economy back on the right track in western Minnesota means making sure that our farmers really can compete on a fair playing field in today's global marketplace. So we need to review our government's regulations, regulations that might not benefit the environment but make it very difficult for our farmers to do business. But you know, ladies and gentlemen, the most important thing that as a state legislator I'd see to be done over the next two years is to start to restore your faith that our state government can work again. What that means is we need to balance our state's budget. We need to balance the budget, like Jay said, without borrowing any more money from our schools. We need to balance the budget without raising any taxes. And for Pete's sakes, we need to balance the budget on time without shutting down our state's government. Those are my values. What you'll hear today is about my record, my record as a successful small business owner, my record as a city councilman in the city of Brandon, where we, re we reduced our city's tax levy by 5% last year. I'm proud of that. Those are the values I'll take to St. Paul. And at the end of the night tonight, I'll ask for your support and for your vote. Thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. And our final candidate for opening remarks, Dave Holman. Dave? Well, after listening to Jay and Scott and have myself in the mix, you out there in 12A have a, something that nobody else has in the entire area, three candidates. And the Independence Party is starting to go little by little, and I'll spend a little time trying to explain what the Independence Party is. Uh, I think the choice is needed because I've heard the same thing the last few times that I've been up here, and everybody is for better schools, lower taxes. You know, I was almost going to bring a little barf can here because I've heard it so much. And uh, it doesn't seem to be happening. So you have a chance to do something else. Now I have to introduce myself. I'm Dave Holman. I'm running for the House District here. And a quick synopsis, I have four children. My wife passed away a few years back, but uh, I do have a very lovely lady friend out there, and uh, I shall introduce a little more of my heritage, Takskaljaha, because that's my Swedish roots. I'm the only person here, I think that's first generation American. Both my parents came over from Sweden, couldn't speak English. I know about immigration. My dad came over and 1903, 15, couldn't speak a word of English. 
My mother came over eight years later, and uh, they finally, they did get married on Christmas Eve, 1912. About, that'll be pretty close to 100 years ago. So that is my Swedish roots. Swedes are not stubborn. Uh, that is something that they've looked in the Bible. They've looked in every possible thing, and they haven't documented a case of a Swede ever being stubborn. So I just for, that's just for general knowledge. Now, the Independence Party is not funded as well as these other two gentlemen's party. At the convention that I was endorsed at, we got 307000 from our leading contributor. And I see an eighth of a million for this party and umpteen for this. It's not really a level playing field, so you will find out I am going uphill. I have some very definite ideas and I will try to bring them out. The Independence Party is not halfway between these other two parties. We are independent, we have our own agendas, and if Jesse the body had been halfway, he never would have been elected. Thank you for time. Thank you, Dave. If you would like to call in with your questions, please call us now, 1-800-726-3178, or email your questions to yourtv at pioneer.org. We will take a short break now and look at some of the great programming that's on Pioneer Public Television while we gather your questions and prepare them for the candidates. Thank you. It's on Pioneer Public Television. After this short break, we'll return to the question and answer portion. We encourage you at this time to either call in or email your questions to the studio for the candidates to address. What is your opinion on limiting marriage to one man and one woman? I really have no opinion on that. So you can go to the next one. All right, thank you. Jay, what is your opinion on limiting marriage to one man and one woman? And you're talking about the marriage amendment. I assume that, yeah. the, certainly. There's one thing everyone should know. Minnesota has already got a definition of marriage. Whether the amendment passes or whether the amendment fails, marriage will always remain the same in Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you. Scott, what is your opinion unlimiting marriage to one man and one woman. I for one uh, support the traditional definition of marriage being between one man and one woman. Uh, th the way I see it, uh, marriage has been a foundation, a building block for our society, for our civilization for thousands of years. I'm very concerned uh, in today's day and age when, when our families are, are getting weaker, we have more single parent households in this country, uh, that we'd be changing the definition of marriage and potentially weakening the family even more. And so I strongly support the, uh, the constitutional amendment that will be on the ballot defining the marriage as it's traditionally defined as being between one man and one woman. Thank you. Thank you. Jay, next question, we'll start with you. What plan do you have to restore the $2.4 billion shift the state is withholding from schools? My plan is high priority. There should be no increase in tax reduction until that's paid back. There should be no large expenders other than the Dome or the Viking Stadium <clears throat> before that's paid back. Uh, we cannot penalize our kids. The single most important resource in our state is our children. And you know what? They deserve every chance they can get. Paying back that $2.4 billion is of monumental importance to me. Thank you. Thank you. Scott, what plan do you have to restore the $2.4 billion shift the state is withholding from public schools? I actually have two plans, and, and take either one of them. I, I don't care which or, or mix them. The first plan, and the best one in my opinion, is to take $400 million from a savings account that we have down in St. Paul. Uh, it's a savings account with about a billion dollars in it. Take $400 million, less than half of that account, and immediately apply it to the, the education shift, repaying the money that we owe our schools. I think that's the best way to, to do it because it would happen immediately. But if you don't like that plan, if you think that money should say, stay in a savings account rather than go, go to our kids, I have another option for you. The other option would be 
Next year, 2013, when we start the budgeting process, the first thing we should do, step number one before we pay for anything else, we should set aside $400 million to repay that, that $2.4 billion that we borrowed from the schools. By doing that, we can build the state's entire budget knowing that we've already done right by our kids. We've already done right by our schools. And so it should be a priority. It should be number one. I've got two plans to do it. Either one is fine with me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. Dave, what plan do you have to restore the $2.4 billion shift the state is withholding from schools? There will be so many plans, it's going to be amazing. But I would make sure that we will tr try to get everything done immediately, as soon as possible, especially in the rural communities. You look at that map, just the transportation of students, uh, the amount of money we spend on all these things, we need to keep it up. And uh, the, the changes are going to be there. And it's going to be repaid. I know that. Okay. All right. Thank you. This is a uh, related question that, that also came in, and that is, uh, starting with you, Scott, what is your opinion of Governor Dayton's veto of the $4 million that was, sent, uh, was set to be sent to schools? Well, actually, I think it was $400 million, and I strongly oppose that. In fact, in, in last April, when Governor Dayton vetoed that, uh, that bill that would have started to repay our education shift, I wrote a, a letter to the editor drastically opposing that because I think it's the wrong move. If our choices are have some extra cash in a savings account down in St. Paul or give it back to our schools, that, especially out here in western Minnesota, that might be having a tough financial time, that's an easy choice for me. Give it back to our schools. That should be number one. Now, one of the things that really concerns me right now is, is Jay and, and his allies right now are running radio ads that are attacking me, claiming that I support that $2.4 billion that we borrowed from our schools, support not repaying it. So I'm wondering, Jay, today, I know these ads aren't yours. Are you willing to say tonight what you said to me in private on Tuesday? Are you willing to say to the public that these ads are false, they're misleading, and they should stop? Are you willing to say that? Can I respond? Certainly. Uh, yeah, you know what, Scott? I agree with you. Are you willing to say that, according to the letter that was written to the paper, that I am not a liar? Well, I, I think what the letter said is that those ads are lies. And they are yeah. lies. They're absolutely lies, and they should end. I support repaying our schools. I support repaying that $2.4 billion that we've borrowed from our schools. These are accounting gimmicks, and they should stop. And so I support it. Those ads are lies, Jay, and they should end. Thank you very much. Dave, what is your opinion of Governor Dayton's veto of the $400 million that was set to be sent to I schools? I kind of got left out of some of the inner um, here, and... Uh, my lady friend gave me a copy of the Elbow Lake paper, and I do know Hilda yeah, from past political things. And uh, I don't know some of the things there. I don't know exactly what's said and how it's meant. And I repay the schools, get them going again. I shouldn't say getting going again. They've been going for a long time but make the finances so they're stable. And I look at Morris alone. When my son graduated, there was 155 kids in the class. My daughter graduated in a class eight years later, and there were 66. We've seen the shift. We will have, we'll need a lot more money for the rural schools because of our declining enrollment. When I was substituting in I went to one of the smaller schools, and I looked at some of their science equipment. You know, it would have been old when I was in high school. I mean, we've got to do something. And I have a friend that teaches college preparatory chemistry. And I look, and I can see the difference in certain things. I have proposed at one time, we start looking at transporting teachers to the rural schools out there so that we can even out the education. And there are some tremendous differences. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Jay, what is your opinion on Governor Dayton's veto of the $400 million that was set to be sent to schools? As, again, mayor, I know it's important to be ready for any emergency. 
and that's what he's looking at. That's why he wants a reserve. And, but I do think the money should be paid back to our kids. Uh, there, it is a good idea at the 2013 when we set the budget again that we set aside the money, $400 million, that go towards repaying the schools. But you must always be prepared for an emergency situation. And that's what that fund is for. Um, and I hate to say this, Scott. You know, I did not make the statements about you. Uh, and I had no control over that. Uh, and I, I did feel bad that I was called a liar because I would never do that. And I would never say anything bad about anybody. I've been brought up to treat people respectfully and not discriminate against anybody for anything. Thank you. Dave, we'll start the next question with okay. you. How would you reform LGA, local government aid, to benefit small rural communities? Well, you probably will have to go back to the basics. And uh, I talked to the city manager in Morris. And we're feeling the pinch, but we've got to get more money in the system to get more of the aids to the small school, I mean the small communities, smaller communities. And I do not know where the funds are coming from. Like I say, it's, uh, it's hard to know. And coming up with instant plans is not one of my better ideas. But I will work to get it up to where it should be. Thank you. Jay, how would you reform LGA to benefit small rural communities? Governor Dayton's got that on the plan right now. He wants to reform LGA. I'm concerned about it. LGA right now, if you've taken and read it, it's complicated. I've read it several times, and I still don't understand it, and I don't think many people do. Um, you know, in between communities like Elbow Lake, our LGA is 40% of our budget. Breckenridge, it's 70% of the budget. Morris is 50% of the budget. What determines that? Some of it has to do with housing before 1942. It's abstract. And what I would do is this. I would make LGA simplified so it's easy to understand, so it would be divided fairly amongst all communities. Um, it's a good thing. It gives us quality of life that's down in the cities that we wouldn't have out, out here otherwise. It makes our communities the best places to live in. LGA is a good thing, but let's simplify it. Let's redo it. Thank you. Scott, how would you reform LGA to benefit small rural communities? Local government aid, LGA, it's a $400 million program, and it's really designed for our small cities. I, I'm a city councilman out in Brandon, and so I understand how important it is for our small cities. What we need to understand, though, is even though it's a $400 million program for small cities, over $100 million of it goes to Minneapolis and St. Paul. That's what I'd do. That's how I'd reform the system. I'd refocus it on the small cities that it's meant to do, to, to help out. I wouldn't spread it around all the cities in Minnesota. I wouldn't spread it around Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Duluth. I'd refocus it on our rural communities so that we can provide basic city services like police, fire protection, streets, waters, sewers. If we do that, if we take that, uh, that portion that's right now being skimmed off by our biggest cities and redistribute it around our, our smaller cities, we'll actually be able to do more with the same amount of spending. In the city of Brandon, our LGA could increase by a third, the same in Elbow Lake or in Morris or any of our small cities out here in western Minnesota. So that's what I do. Refocus the program on what it's really meant for, our small cities, especially out here in rural western Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you. Jay, nursing homes in rural areas are facing tighter regulations and lower reimbursements, all while the cost of care is going up. How will you help nursing homes continue to provide quality care to residents? I'm a great advocate of nursing homes. I've seen what they can do. And they do several things. They provide good care that I couldn't provide or any family could provide. Uh, the second thing is they provide an income for small communities. Uh, for instance, Barrett and Hoppen, I'm sure their total salary is about a million dollars, and that stays in our area. It's great for the economy. I do know this. They are having trouble staffing their homes. We need to increase their pay, and we can do that by having the pay rate for the nursing home staff the same as it is in the metro area. There's a difference between the two. And secondly, 
they are burdened with what is referred to as a bed tax. And I think we should eliminate that so it makes the nursing homes more profitable, especially a bed tax that's paid daily on empty beds. That shouldn't occur. You know, better salaries, you know, uh, less taxation. And you know what? Those nursing homes, my mother's in one. She's seven miles from me. I see her every day. If she were to be in a further home away, such as Fergus or, or Alexandria, that wouldn't occur. We need to support our nursing homes. Thank you. Thank you. Scott, nursing homes in rural areas are facing tighter regulations and lower reimbursements, all while the care, cost of care is going up. How will you help nursing homes continue to provide quality care to residents? You know, on Tuesday of this week, I was at, at the Hoffman Nursing Home, the Good Samaritan Society. And what you see when, when you walk through and you meet the residents in, in a nursing home is how important it is that we as a society stand behind uh, all the programs that we have to protect our most vulnerable citizens. These are men and women who couldn't live on their own. These are men and women who often uh, couldn't even live with a family member who is working during the day because they wouldn't be able to take care of themselves. So they absolutely have to have the care that's, uh, that, that uh, they need at this time in their lives. I, I agree with Jay. One of the biggest problems that I heard from, uh, from the folks out in Hoffman was the rate of pay. They said their, their new nurses were being paid $9.60 an hour. And that it's tough to find somebody who's both qualified and willing to do that kind of work for such a low rate of pay. One of the reasons that the pay is so low is because Medicaid reimbursement rates, these are the rates that are set by the state and they're the rates that's, that are charged uh, for, um, to, to Medicaid for reimbursement for a person who's staying in a nursing home. These Medicaid reimbursement rates are at or below the costs of simply operating a nursing home. And so we really need to look at ways to increase those rates so that our nursing homes don't have to operate in the red and they can operate in the black. Because we owe it to, the, to our seniors, we owe it to the elderly, and we owe it to our most frail and vulnerable. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dave, nursing homes in rural areas are facing tighter regulations and lower reimbursements, all while the cost of care is going up. How will you help nursing homes continue to provide quality care to residents? Well, I'm most likely to go, you know, <laughs> in there. And the thing is, my wife was a nursing assistant or a nurse's aide, and I used to get the total thing from where she worked. And those people do a fantastic job, and I, can't, I, I see everything coming through that we want to do is costing more, and I think the most vulnerable people are the people in the nursing homes and assisted care and some of these other programs that we can, you know, just bring... Uh, I, oh, I kind of go down and visit the people in Morris, and occasionally I have a deal with the forest to bring a little flower in there. And one thing there is, there are more and more people with old timers, Alzheimer's disease. I got old timers, and it's going to be more and more expensive. And as it ages, I go have coffee with a group of retired teachers, and most of them are. 75, 80, 85, 90, and they get together. And sooner or later, there's going to be more need in our area. So that will, uh, I'll give my last 30 seconds up. But you get the idea that I am for the upgrading of pay rates. Thank you. Scott, invasive species are becoming a serious threat to our waterways. Do you think the state should do more to prevent the spread of invasive species, and if so, how? You know, we, we've put a, a tremendous investment into slowing and hopefully stopping invasive species getting up here. So many of our, our waterways right now uh, are vital 
industrial areas for especially tourism out here in western Minnesota. And so I, I'm not a biologist. I can't give an opinion on whether this or that plan would slow the, the rate of, uh, of invasive species, but I would trust the, the biologist. I would trust the experts on these things. And I would also consult with industry leaders to make these decisions. But in the end, you know, as a legislator, there's a lot of issues that we, we simply have outside of our realm of expertise, our field of expertise. And so the decision-making process is so important. And so that's why I want to tell you that I'm going to consult the experts. I'm going to consult the, uh, the people who are going to be most affected by issues like this uh, before making a decision. And th in the end, I'll, I'll be making a decision I, that I think is best for the people of Minnesota. So thank you very much. Thank you. Dave, do you think the state should do more to prevent the spread of invasive species? And if so, how? Well, they seem to be doing an excellent job, but now I got to clean my boat off more often when I go fishing and everything else. Uh, but I hate to tell people this. They're going to sneak around the barriers and this, that, and the other. We can slow it up, but we probably cannot totally prevent. And as I look down my street, there are still some elm standing there that survived the Dutch elm. Now we got the bore, the ash bore coming through. We've already survived the birch wilt and a few other, but we have to take certain steps to slow it down and maybe, and there are certain species that are resistant to the Dutch elm disease and you can get them now from what I hear, okay? Thank you. Jay, do you think the state should do more to prevent the spread of invasive species? And if so, how? Yeah, I do think so. Uh, tourism is a big part of our economy here in Minnesota, especially in the lake country. And we need to protect those lakes. You know, laws and regulations are good, but they also have to be enforced. And what I would like to see is there's lakes that are designated as infested. I'd like to see the access to those lakes limited, especially public access. And I'd like to see monitoring there, which would control the spread of invasive species from one lake to another. And it's going to cost us money. And we'll have to have, especially in the summer months, people monitoring craft that go in and out and make sure they're washed and clean and uh, their bilge tanks are empty. It'll cost money, but if we can't stop the spread of these invasive species, all our lakes are going to be infected, and what's that cost going to be? We're going to lose valuable lakeshore property, and we're going to lose business that's important to our state. Thank you. Thank you. Dave, have you ever been an official of a political party, either now or in the past? That is a good question. Yes, I have. I... Uh, Many years ago, I joined up with the Republican Party. I was kind of in the middle between the Democrats and Republicans. And I joined the Republicans because at that time, they were the more intellectual party. And I had the privilege of working with uh, the, I'm trying to think of the plywood man. Uh, Rudy. Rudy the Perpich and Bosowicz. They're out in Bosowich and all these characters and uh, Al Hui, Arnie Carlson, they were a moderate group that would at, be able to have, answer questions. You would have intellectual discussions. And I've kind of dropped out of the Republican group towards the independents because I looked at the presidential candidates that the Republicans came up with. And if there's ever a need for a change in education, we need to teach history, social stuff. These guys didn't know what was going on, you know. And who did Paul Revere go and warn, you know, to uh, I can re the one guy that was going to eliminate three cabinet posts and could only think of two. One didn't even know the age that the kids would vote at, you know. Uh, it's kind of a, a zoo. Our quality of candidates for both parties have definitely gone down. 
That's why I'm with the independents. Yes, I was, and I was very active. I went to state. And uh, just one thing, uh, I went to one of the state conventions and I supported Gerald Ford, who gave up a career pardoning Nixon so the well, country wouldn't be harmed. And uh, yeah, Thank that's you. time. Jay, have you ever been an official of a political party, either now or in the past? I never have. I'm just a concerned citizen working and trying as hardest to save and help a part of the state that I truly love. And Scott, have you ever been an official of a political party, either now or in the past? Yes, I, I have been. I, I've been interested in public policy since I was a, a pretty young kid. Uh, I, right now, I actually serve as the deputy chair of the Douglas County Republicans. And last year, I had the honor of being elected by the 7th Congressional District uh, to represent the, the Congressional District on the State Executive Board of the Republican Party of Minnesota. I was also honored, once I was on that board, to be a part of the investigation team that, that looked into some of the financial corruption that had happened during a prior regime uh, on, the, uh, on the Republican Party in Minnesota. And so as a part of that team, we did uh, a financial review of the state party's finances. We did a report. Uh, we helped assess where the party was uh, financially and what needed to be done to fix the problems that we had faced in the past. And so I, I'll continue whether I, I win or lose today, or excuse me, in November, I'll, I'll continue to be interested in uh, public policy and I'll probably continue to be politically active. So thank you very much, that's an excellent question. All right, Jay, what is your opinion on voter ID? And I can only speak again as a mayor, all right? And as a mayor, I'm always concerned about finance. And also, I'm concerned about restricting people from the right to vote. The thing that concerns me is there might be several classes of people that might be restricted. And one of them is my mother. I'm worried about nursing home residents having the right to vote. I'm worried about college students that change addresses having the right to vote. I'm worried about military personnel and absentee voters. In my small community, there's been no voter impersonation fraud because our election officials or judges are familiar with everybody that comes through the doors. You know what? That's the case in most Minnesota communities. My other concern is about the high cost of implementation. The voter ID amendment is an amendment that's unfunded. Where will that money come from? And how much is it going to be and is it going to cost my city and my county large amounts of money? And we can't afford it right now. We're, we're in financial trouble. I feel the amendment is too vague on implementation. The amendment should have been thought out better, and it should have been thought out how to pay for it before it was put on the ballot. I'm voting no on it. Thank you. Thank you. Scott, what is your opinion of the voter ID? Uh, vote, the voter ID amendment is an amendment that will be on the ballot this fall in November, the same time uh, the three of us are on the ballot. The, that amendment would require photo identification for a person who, uh, who comes to the polls to vote. My opinion, I'll be voting yes. I think it's a very reasonable rule to ask somebody to, to show a picture ID when they come to, to execute the most important part of a democracy, their right to vote. We need to protect that vote, not only the right to come to the polls, but also the right, once you voted, to make sure your vote isn't canceled out by somebody who's committing a fraud. Now, I, I live in the city of Brandon, just like, uh, like you, Jay. I don't think there's a lot of voter fraud in the city of Brandon. But I will say this, I'm concerned, and I'm also concerned with the, uh, the level of opposition to this very reasonable rule that we have. Now, I would commit to this. If voter ID passes, and if I'm elected as your state legislator, I'll make sure not only are identification, photo identification available to seniors, to college students, to military personnel, not only is it available, but that it's easy to get and that it's free. And once we've done that, there really isn't any excuse not to have a picture identification, and we'd ask that reasonable rule be implemented when you come to the polls. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dave, what is your opinion of voter ID? Uh, right now, from everything I've heard, it's much ado about nothing like the Shakespearean play. Uh, 
when we get a surplus of funds, let's enforce it and take care of everything. But as it is now, I see absolutely in our area no reason for it. And, uh, but if elected, I would put in one thing that for the photographic purposes, that the picture has to be good. Mm -hmm. uh, like on most licenses, I think maybe some people wouldn't want to show it. But that'll be it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Scott, uh, gentlemen, we have uh, time for one more quick question, so I'm going to ask you a question that could be a yes or no answer. Um, are you pro-life or pro-choice? And I believe we're starting with Scott. Thank you. That's an excellent question. I I'm pro-life, and I'm committed not only to be pro-life, but to, to pursuing policies here in Minnesota that reduce the number of abortions that we have. In my opinion, as a society, we have a, a clear obligation to protect the most vulnerable citizens among us. Now, we talked earlier about folks in nursing home, but I put it on the other side, too. Our unborn children are incredibly vulnerable. I'm committed to protecting them. I'm pr committed to, to reducing the number of abortions, and I hope one day that I'll be committed and we'll all celebrate the, uh, the overturning of Roe versus Wade. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dave, are you pro-life or pro-choice? Generally both. <laughs> And that makes it kind of interesting. Well, philosophically, I am pro-life, but in practical, I've seen so many incidents and things. And what bothers me more is some of these organizations, whether they be church or f do not about. Well, First thing is to stop it before it comes. And sex education should be perhaps mandated or something. So you eliminate, you would eliminate a lot there in childbearing a little later. But uh, it's a question that I can, and then guardian ad litem going out and seeing other things. Uh, there is some time that the choice might have to be made. And I would hate to see a person punished for a choice that has to be made. And there will be some very, very hard questions on that. Uh, and who should make the choice? The woman. But again, I would be there to, for prevention and everything else. Thank okay? you. Jay, pro-life or pro-choice? Tough question. <laughs> I've never been for abortion but a woman has the right to choose, as she should. Thank you. Thank you. And that's all the time we have for questions this evening. We will now move into the closing remarks presented by the candidates. They will each have two minutes for their closing remarks. We'll start in the reverse order that we began in. And so uh, Dave Holman, the Independence Party candidate, will be the first to give his closing remarks. Dave? Well, if elected, there are a great many things that I would like to do. First thing is in the educational system, and uh, we need to do a better job of teaching history, teaching to the kids that are not the brightest and most brilliant. We've got to, like when I went into teaching, you took the kid where he was, and you took him as far as they can go. and. Uh, Nowadays, we're teaching just for the best and brightest to turn them into scientists, you know, and everything is on science, math, everything else. And I've had many kids that probably did not have the capabilities of fitting, fitting in anything here. Some of the best teaching I have done, if I was evaluated on it, would probably be my salary to be down there. The kids are successful successful families, you know, really great things. We, we have to do that. And I think at my son's reunion, they, I took up a collection to give to the more the average kid. The top kids don't quite often need it. And as far as the jobs in science and math, and we need them people all the way through, uh, I think it was arts and entertainment when I was surfing, said 60% of 
these people who stay in this particular mode or a job, looking for jobs, do not get jobs within their fields. So that will be good enough there. Thank you, Dave. Now we will hear the closing remarks from the DFL candidate, Jay McNamer. Jay? I'm not a career politician. I'm a small town mayor who's trying to protect and preserve an area and lifestyle that I've grown to love. I have no desire to be anything other than an advocate for rural Minnesota. I know that in order for property taxes to come down and schools to get paid back, we must kickstart our economy. The single most important aspect is to create jobs. I have a plan to create jobs in rural Minnesota by replacing our aging infrastructure in communities of 6,000 people or less. We must also in give incentives to help small businesses create jobs in the private sector. And the final part of my plan is to bring back jobs that were lost overseas. My plan is a work in progress, and it may need to be revised and expanded. I'm not looking for criticism. Instead, I'm looking for help. A legislature of Democrats and Republicans working together to solve our economic problems by innovative thinking is what we need. My model for the past four years as mayor has been this. It's amazing what can be accomplished when it doesn't matter who gets the credit. This is the type of attitude we need in our legislature. If you elect me, that's what you'll get. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Now, the, finally, the closing remarks from the Republican candidate, Scott Butcher. Scott? Thank you. Uh, before I get started, I, I want to thank you here at Pioneer Public Television for putting on not only this forum, but all the forums between now and Election Day. I also want to thank you, the viewers at home. Thank you for being interested, and thank you for being an educated voter. You know, in closing tonight, what I want to talk about is public service. You know, I'm asking for your support because I want to serve you down in St. Paul. I want to serve you because I think I can make your life easier, make it easier to find a job, make it easier to have a few extra bucks in your pocket at the end of the day. But public service isn't just being about running for office or being an elected official. It's about our communities. It's about who we are out here in, in western Minnesota. Public service is really about, uh, about doing all kinds of things, whether it's formally through the Lions or through uh, a church group, or whether it's informally by just helping the, the lady down the, the street uh, who's getting a little older, helping her out with the yard work. You know, one of the things that I'm really concerned about right now is the fabric of our communities. This fabric's been so, so neatly woven out here in western Minnesota, but I'm worried that it's pulling apart, and I'm worried that our communities are, are losing the vigor that they've had in the past. I want to reverse that, but I can't do it alone. I need your support, and that's why I'm asking for your vote in November. And before I sign off tonight, I just want to say one thing to, to my two boys, Tommy and Jackson at home. It's almost 8 o'clock, boys. It's bath time. Get upstairs, and for Pete's sakes, don't give your mother a hard time. So thank you all for being here and, and uh, for watching tonight, and, and have a great evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. That concludes tonight's debate for the House District 12A. Please stay tuned for the next debates, which will include the House District 12B. And thank you to the candidates for joining us tonight. Thank you to all of our viewers who have tuned in. Remember, your voice is important. Make your voice heard by no voting on November 6th. Thank you. <laughs>